那么开始录了。呃，大家晚上好，呃，非常感谢大家，呃，能够参加今天晚上的讲座。那、呃、我是本次讲座的主持人，啊、呃，我叫胡丰源。然后今天今天晚上的讲座的主题呢是 entrepreneurship and innovation。那我们非常荣幸的邀请到了那个 Studio 造的 founder， 还有 managing 呃 partner， 呃，吉米秋。然后，呃，非常欢迎 Jimmy 来到跑动英伦俱乐部，欢迎 Jimmy。呃，然后呢，呃，在此呢，特别要感谢一下 Jojo，Jojo 啊 Jojo,、呃，能够邀请到啊、呃、这么优秀的嘉宾，啊、呃，也是非常感谢的。还有呢，我们还想感谢一下那个我们跑动英伦俱乐部的主席啊，呃,呃何一舟何老大，然后谢谢他为大家提供这么好的、这么开放啊、这么开放的平台。能够吸引到全英甚至全球的最优秀的华人，呃，能够在这个平台上让自己呃发出声音，呃呃，然后呢，我们我大概讲一下今天呃今天讲座的呃流程，呃，开始我们大概会用呃十分钟左右的时间，呃，有一个会员自我介绍的一个 session， 啊、呃，我尽量把它控制在十分钟的样子。然后之后呢，啊、呃，我们的嘉宾 Jimmy 会做一个分享，给大家会讲一下自己的经历，然后讲一下这个 entrepreneurship 这个理念，还有他的一些 practice。嗯、呃，然后之后呢，我们会进入 Q&A 环节，然后我们会根据今天这个问题的多少呢，可能会适当的延展一下今天整个的这个时间，但是我们啊、呃、不会超过九十分钟。那啊，我们就现在就开始自我介绍的这个环节，啊，那先从我开始吧，啊，我叫胡丰源，现在住在剑桥，啊，呃，是在一家生物制药公司从事研发工作，啊，那我加入咱们呃、啊、跑动英伦也是不是很久，但是呃、啊，对咱们这个跑团的理念非常呃、啊、认可，然后我今天呢，希望能从吉米身上学习到。呃，很多关于这个 entrepreneurship 的这个理念，因为呃，我们经常都听到 entrepreneurship， 但是 entrepreneurship 这个，呃，我也是最近才听到这么提，所以说非常感兴趣。那下面呢，我就根据我现在能够看到的这个 name list 来，呃，点一下名吧。那我们叫 Sarah Dobby。在吗？能不能开一下视频？啊，我我在，我在。嗯，好，你介绍一下自己好吗？好呀，好呀，我我在普化甬道，我是做个人税的，然后我在一个，我我我是西方人啊，我是在一个中国团队，然后主要是负责来到英国的中国外派人员，呃，做个人税咨询。嗯，然后。我不知道你还还讲讲哪个方面？哦、uh, oh, ，很好，很好，谢谢你，谢谢你。呃、uh, ，那我们下一位，呃、uh, ，孙飞，能不能麻烦开一下视频？孙飞在吗？呃、uh, ，大家好，能听到吗？可以的。呃、uh, ，不好意思，因为我刚刚洗完澡。<笑><笑>没关系，没关系。<笑>非常不好意思啊，嗯，没关系，能介绍一下你自己吗？呃，我的情况是这样的，我刚刚从 U C L 毕业，然后现在在一家呃教育咨询公司，然后他也是创业型的，然后现在在这个公司实习。对，嗯，然后我对创业比较感兴趣，嗯、所以嗯，这也是我第一次来参加这个活动。对，很高兴认识大家。欢迎你，欢迎你。啊、uh, ，那下一位 fish fish 黄啊，小鱼。大家好，我是黄小鱼，然后我是在一家保险，呃，伦敦一家保险公司做 IT， 嗯，很期待今天的讲座，谢谢。好的，那接下来是韩哥。嗯、呃，大家好，我是韩哥，然后就是想跟老师多学习一下，嗯，谢谢大家。好的，好的。那么下面蔡老师给我们说一下吧。<笑>欢迎蔡老师。呃，你 mute 了
老师，要 unmute。老师听不到你说什么，你你静音了。啊<笑>啊好啊，还是静音。<笑>蔡老师，你还是静音。啊，现在好了。现在可以了啊！啊大家好，我是 Iris 蔡，那个。我今天带着这个跑动英伦的奖牌来参加，我是跑动英伦的会员，觉得特别光荣。<笑>呃，那我本人呢也是 entrepreneur， 然后我创建 Positive Speaking 有十一年了。呃，那其中的酸甜苦辣哈，还有这个呃成功的啊、呃、快乐都特别都有。那今天呢，我想这个向大家学习，得到更多的激励啊、呃，然后呢呃做的更高兴。好，谢谢大家。谢谢蔡老师。那我们下面是啊，这是一个手机号，手机的型号，华为啊 P 三零。那这个不知道名字是什么，嗯呵呵，这个你能看到自己的 ID 吗？能不能开一下 camera？ 华为 P 三零，是不是不知道自己的这个有没有？嗯。那我们跳到下面的好吗？嗯、呃，我们有呃于洋，呃，喂，大家好，嗯、呃，我叫于子阳，我是从事会计和税务方面，服、哦、我也是自己创业，嗯、呃，这里很高兴这次有机会和这名学习，谢谢。嗯，谢谢你，谢谢你。好的，那我们下面请 Mandy， Mandy 在吗 ？Hello， 大家好，我叫 Mandy 张，嗯，那个我自己也是从事这个呃公寓地产投资之类的啊这个方向，然后很期待今天的内容。好，谢谢，今天就说这么就说这么多。好，谢谢你，谢谢你。嗯、啊，那下面我们有 Hillary， Hillary 在吗？哦，他还在呃、uh, connecting， 呃、uh, ，Hillary， 那我们暂时先跳过这个。好的，那我们请梁凯老师讲一下。哎、hey, ，大家好，我我叫梁凯，我是一个呃教育科技公司的呃创业者。呃，然后同时的话也是呃几个创业公司的 advisor， 嗯、呃，所以说很很很高兴今天晚上能够加入这个讨论，谢谢。嗯，谢谢梁凯老师。呃，我们下面有王晨，王晨在吗 ？Hello，Hello。嗨 hello, hello. ， Hi, 你好。大家好，我叫王晨，呃，是学音乐的，啊、呃，做音乐的。谢谢，<笑>谢谢你。好的，那我们下面有 Christina， <笑> Christina 在吗？呃，大家好，我现在呃在英国上班，然后做投资金融方面的。呃，因为我还就才工作两年，所以还处在一个多看、多听、多学习，所以想加入这个，嗯、呃，想多听一下，看一下别人的经验分享啊，一些意见等等。好的，谢谢你，谢谢你啊、呃！我们有 Hillary， 我看 Hillary 已经连上了。嗯、啊，对我连上了。嗨，大家好。嗯、um, 嗯，可能群里很多人都认识我了。呃、uh, ，我是之前嗯、uh, 在呃、uh, 瑞士银行工作了八年，然后去年刚刚自己做了呃、uh, co-founder 之一，创呃、uh, 创建了一个 fintech startup， 然后所以想进来嗯、um, 向大家学习请教一下。非常感谢 Hillary， 啊， uh, 那我们请啊，谭、uh, 培涛谭掌柜介绍一下自己吧。大家好，我叫谭培涛，我是山东人，来伦敦十八年了。嗯、uh, ，主要是涉及无人机和水产品加工，还有个外汇方面的业务。然后刚才看了一下这个 Jimmy 的领英，感觉很厉害，然后料肯定很多。所以挺开心能有机会去听他的分享
，谢谢。好的，谢谢团长贵。那我们再挑最后一个吧，森迪，森迪在吗？森迪，你在线吗？嗯，没有打开麦。那我们看看，再挑一个吧，最后一个。啊，小梅，小梅在吗？啊，我以为啊，大家好，我以为我就躲过去了。我想最后一个，因为因为我坐床上了。嗯嗯，那我自自我介绍一下，呃，大家好，我叫张小梅，我来英国有五六年了吧，之前是过来那个读硕士，呃，之前的背景一直也是工科的背景。但是最近这一两年转到了那个分析师的呃这个行业，呃这这个职位，呃疫情期间呢，嗯、呃、我开始做那个定制线上英语，嗯然后其实我一直怎么说呢，呃呃一直对就是特别想跟那个呃优秀的华人学习，呃作为可能中国人在英国确实我觉得在工作生活上面。是想有很多东西想要和大家一起交流学习的，想就是如果呃如果有看到身边的华人能够做的这么优秀，对自己来说是一种很大的激励，希望能跟大家一起学习。嗯，谢谢。好的，好的，谢谢小梅说的非常好、嗯。那你就来对地方了，那我们这个俱乐部就是你要找的。嗯、呃。那那我们大概这个自我介绍的环节也啊、呃、也到时间了，我就不想再再拖延了。然后那我想在那机密分享之前呢，插播一个小广告，用一到两分钟的时间，然后呃希望大家呃能够呃谅解一下。然后呃现在我们跑动英伦呢正在推广一个公益的教育活动，嗯、呃，然后叫，好的叫什么？<笑>筑梦计划，筑梦计划第二期，这个筑梦计划呢是一个 mentoring program， 然后报名的学员呢，呃，会和在华呃，就是已经非常有成就的一些导师能够有一对一的呃面面谈的机会，然后这个对于个人成长啊，或者你想创业呀、啊，各个方面呢，自自我成长啊，各个方面都会有很好的帮助，就是一个。呃，我个人认为是个非常好的机会。那么，希望感兴趣的会员或者是呃你们的朋友能够关注这个筑梦计划，然后也能帮我们推广。嗯、呃，谢谢大家。那那我现在就把时间交给 Jimmy。然后呃，刚才可能有一些呃朋友还没有来得及上线 ，Jimmy 可能有一部分演讲会用英文。啊、呃，那我觉得大家也肯定没有问题的。那谢谢 Jimmy 了。好的，时间交给你。谢谢谢谢，大家好。其实你说一部分是用英文，我也许会 disappoint people。我很很大一部分恐怕会是英文，也是英文。不好意思，其实我的中文有点吃力。呃，我我先做一个自我介绍吧，然后你们就理解为什么。嗯<笑>、um, ，share screen。OK，OK，、okay. 大家可以看到。我的 screen 对吧？ OK。嗯、um, ，所以，我我叫 Jamie， 呃，我的中文名字是邱硕轩。嗯、um, ，今天晚上，呃，很很高兴可以在这里面跟你们分享一下我我的嗯、um, 我的故事和我我的工作的内容，对吧？嗯，其实我很少有这种机会。<笑>我我的手身边的华人圈其实特别小，我一般来说不会跟，呃，我的朋友大部分都是外国人，所以我我我说中文和和和就是跟跟中国人来往的机会其实挺少的。所以，嗯，不好意思，今天晚上我的如果中文说的不太到家或者什么东西你们不太理解的话，呃，你可以嗯 afterwards 给我发个邮件问问都可以的。嗯。所以今天晚上我想跟你们说一下这三点。我的故事，呃，创新，嗯，创新方面，其实我介绍一下，呃 ，four key principles， 
创新的一个 introductory 第四四个四个最重要的 principles， 嗯、呃，然后我再解释一下 Studio z e l 呃，我的公司，嗯、呃，是是干什么的，然后 entrepreneurship 是什么东西，嗯、呃，也许今天晚上的内容不会那么深刻，就是一个 introduction， 其实，可是如果你们有兴趣的话，还有什么别的问题 ，like I said， feel free to get in touch。So、um, about me,、uh, this is Studio Zao. So I was Studio Zao's managing partner, her founder. Um, this company is about two years old. Um, two years ago, I founded this company with a business partner. Um, I will later introduce more deeply. But now, just to say a little bit about our company. Um, we have many different clients. What we do is actually to help. How to say? 就是一个创新咨询公司吧，就是帮助客户发展内部的 entrepreneur 有人才。嗯、um, ，我们相信，呃，创新公司真正的能去去创新，需要里面有 entrepreneur 有人才，才能 successfully innovate。这是一个很重要的一点。嗯、um, ，所以 that's what we do。嗯，这是一些我们一些客户。嗯、um,。我是天津人，其实我我出生在天津，可是我从小在英国长大的。我是六岁来到英国的，所以其实我挺挺 pretty English， to be honest with you <笑>。我所以我，嗯，我我大部分的呃工作啊经验都是都是在在外国。嗯，我是在 London School of Economics 做的呃 bachelor's degree。嗯，我差不多十二年了吧。毕业，十年前毕业的，十二年前在那方开始，嗯，学习的。从 LSC 毕业，其实很多人一般会有三个 route。第一个 route 就是去做一个 banker， 对吧？也许你们也知道，很听说有些人在剑桥，现在肯定 coming out of Cambridge 有很多人去做做 banking， 对吧？所以第一个 path 就是去做一个 banker， 第二个 path 就是当一个 lawyer。然后第三个 path 就是做 consultant， 其实就就这三个吧。然后，嗯、um, ，我毕业的时候，其实我没有做 any of these。嗯，当时我毕业的时候，我去创新，呃，我我就是去做了一个 startup。嗯，我花了两年的时间去做一个 startup in education。嗯，我学到了很多，这就是为什么我现我后来就是 career 就是关于创新啊。这些方面都是因为那时候我开始做的自己一个 startup。嗯、um, ，我还有一些别的爱好，就是嗯、um, ，improv。我不知道大家有没有过经历过去，去去去玩一玩，就是呃、uh, ，it's you know improvised in the moment。嗯，其实我我介绍这个呃、uh, hobby， 因为对创新来说很有嗯、um, 很有 relevance。嗯。这是一些我的表演的照片，嗯、um, ，然后我我的 career 差不多就是从二零零九年开始，嗯、um, ，做这个 startup， 就是叫 Uni， 当时候是呃一个 startup 帮助大学生去学习，就是互相 tutor each other effectively， 嗯、um, ，然后后来我就参我就加入了安永，在安永在那在待了差不多呃五五五个半年的时间，嗯、um,。在安永，我我的第一个工作就是加入咨询那个部门，呃，在咨询的部门我，我我也觉得学到了很多，可是其实挺 dry 的，没有那么那么 fun。嗯、呃，当时安永他们也对 startups 很有呃 interest， 所以他就问问我，你之前来安永之前你是做一个 startup， 所以你能不能帮我们想一想，嗯、呃，对，呃，就是。呃、uh, ，startup 这方面的的的 strategy 应该是什么东西？所以，嗯、um, ，故事说来特别长，可是后来我就呃、uh, 给安永嗯、um, 开发了一个新的一种 service， 就是 startup acceleration， 就是他们第一个 innovation service。当时当时安永的咨询的 consulting business 在在英国没有这方面的 service， 嗯、um, ，可是他们需要，所以我就给他们做了一个 startup accelerator， 就是帮助大公司大客户去更。呃，更多接触这些小的 emerging fast growth technology businesses， 嗯、um, ，and 这些新的科技，怎么去用这些科技，怎么去 partner， 怎么去，嗯、um, ，you know， 呃、uh, ，去寻找 the correct use case for 这些 technology， 然后安永就去
uh, install, to implement, to deliver these services. Um, 其实在，在在这个时候，我就开始发发现了，嗯、um, ，entrepreneurship 其实那时候还很早，可是我自己的经验在安永是一个 entrepreneur， 就是一个 entrepreneur on the inside of an organization， 就是 entrepreneur effectively， 因为我给安永创造了一个新的嗯、um, 服务，之前没有的，所以。这个自对自己来说也是一个，就就是一个 entrepreneurial experience。我也发现，在客户的公司里面，很多时候客户会会，嗯，来安永，然后问你能不能帮我们去设计一个新的创，就是创新部门啊，或者设计一个嗯加速器啊，或者孵化器啊这种这种东西。然后说到底，他们会说 OK， 我可以帮你们做，嗯，可是。这个人才是从哪来的？你去运行这些孵化器啊，去做这些 experiment， 这个 innovation。那那 where do you find the people to do this？ 然后大公司总是会说，嗯，我们我们会从外面找，对吧？会找这些 serial entrepreneur 来来给我们去去 operate 这些 experiments。他们从来不会说，其实我们公司的内部有很多人才。嗯，我认识很多人可以去去去做这个这个 job， 或者去给这个机会。他们不会这样说。所以从那时候我就开始想，为什么大公司会 often overlook 他们自己公司里面的这些 talent entrepreneurial talent， 总是去去外面找这些 entrepreneurial talent 去引进来，然后然后 I don't know、uh, work with them on a contract basis. Anyways， 嗯、um, ，从安永呃离开以后，我就嗯。Um, 自己做一个自己的 independent strategy consultant， 在这个时期，我其实做了很多不同的嗯呃、um, uh, projects， 呃，当那时候我有一个 project 叫 City 嗯、um, AI London， 是一个 artificial intelligence network， 这时候我也在 Dubai 嗯、um, 做了很多 project， 跟、uh, Dubai government run 了很多 innovation 呃、uh, project， 然后在那一方也是 managing director for a 嗯、um, fintech accelerator， 嗯、um, 和 HSBC 和 Visa。和迪拜的政府合作，嗯、um, ，去呃、uh, ，yeah， accelerate 一些 fintech businesses in the Middle East region。所以，可是这时候我总是在想 entrepreneurship 这个这个这个 issue， 对吧？我总是在想 entrepreneurship 是我，我我应该怎么办？我总是觉得 entrepreneurship 是一个 opportunity， 是一个创新的 opportunity。大公司会嗯。Um, Uh, no one's focusing on entrepreneurship as an as a route for innovation. So I went back to London and started Studio Zao. Um, Studio Zao actually is Zao is creating Zao, so so it's a you know creation studio. The meaning. Um, I do my my these experiences, these these experiences, so many years, actually, have a common thread, which is. Um, all innovative, 对吧？呃、uh, ，我离开了嗯、um, LSE 的时候，我没有加入 banking。虽然我那时候我一我应该加入 banking， 我有一个 offer， 可是我拒绝了去做一个 startup。然后进入了安永，我也是没有按照他们嗯、um, 就是 consulting 的工作去做，我我就是创就是 created something new。然后呢，我后来 Studio Z 也是自己的公司，所以我我一生来其实就是就是一。Creating new stuff. Um, I, uh, feel, uh, in such different contexts, I learned a lot. But I also know that today evening, um, in the stage, there are many, uh, there are many people in this place. There are many, um, very experienced people. So I just share some of my, uh, seen framework, seen some principles. Um, I hope after this, afterwards, you have some questions. We can. Uh, have a discussion or something like that. Um, so, Chuangxin, uh, in this next section, I just want to introduce some four key principles of entrepreneurship. We will often give customers some very quick talks. Then, when we give these talks, we will talk about a lot of different topics. 以下这些 slides 其实就是我们一般的 introductory slides about、uh, lean principles of entrepreneurship.、Um, why is this important? Because 
entrepreneurship 和 entrepreneurship 其实也有很多的 similarity。Uh, entrepreneurship is being entrepreneurial inside a large organization, and there are lots of other organizational, um, contextual,、uh, resource-based, funding-based challenges around this. But at the heart of it, it's all entrepreneurship. So,、um, 我想介绍一些 entrepreneurial principles. So, 从现在开始，也许我我就我就其实会用英文了。嗯、um, ，So seventy-two percent of all products. Fail, right? This is a. I mean, I think there's、uh, there are other stats. There's eighty percent as well. There's seventy percent, but pretty much a lot of new products fail. Whether you're in a large organization, whether you're outside of a large organization, new things don't tend to work very well. Why is that? Well, it's usually because there's no need. There is a、um, solution looking for a problem, as many people would say. Um, no market need. It's it's all the same reason, right? Products fail because there's no market need. Now, there are the four lean principles of entrepreneurship that I, I kind of want to just talk about today. The first one is don't fall in love with your first idea. Second one is something called don't fall into the build trap. That is a、uh, a trap that we all fall into, and is a very human nature to fall into this. The third principle is. Only commit resources as uncertainty decreases, and I'll explain a little bit more what that means. And the fourth one is apply a scientific approach to entrepreneurship. So,、um, uh, has、uh, have people here read the Lean Startup? That book called called Lean Startup. 大家都都读过这本书吗？或者听说过这本书？没有。Okay. Well,、um, I highly recommend. 我我真劝大家，如果你们有时间的话。去去读读这本书，因为嗯很有意思。其实我这些这些四个 principles of lean entrepreneurship 就是 summarizing this book effectively, taking the four key principles from from this book, um and explaining it in a more uh contextual way. So, what do we mean by don't fall in love with your first idea? Um, we all. Have a human nature, which is when you have an idea for a new product or something. When you wake up in the morning and you say, "You know what? I have a great idea for something," you you fall in love with this idea, right?、Um, your first instinct is not to say,、um, "Actually, I want to disprove my idea." Your first instinct is, "This is a great idea, and I bet it's going to work." We all fall in love with it, but most successful propositions, most successful ventures, startups. They were never the first idea. In fact, they were the nth idea. So, here's an example. Um, 大家有没有听说过这个 startup 叫 Bourbon？ 嗯，听说过吗？我看不到大家的的 camera， 所以我就 assume everyone's shaking their heads. <laughs> okay, <laughs> 没有听说过，对吧？所以，所以 Bourbon 是嗯呃、um, uh, the idea behind this app. Was um, 我我出去去去酒吧或者出去去 club or something. 呃、uh, ，我想告诉我朋友我在这地方，所以呢，我就呃、uh, check in in this location, right? 呃、uh, ，take a picture, check in, say something, um, tell my friends, hey, come, I'm I'm at this pub, I'm at this bar. Simple idea, okay? Um, but it wasn't successful, okay? Because evidently, you men don't make things work. So you know, it's it wasn't successful. What was the real idea? <clears throat> Do you guys know? Because bourbon failed because they didn't really understand what their customers wanted. What their customers really wanted, as they saw from the behavior, was everyone loved taking pictures, but nobody liked to check in. Nobody liked to. Write any messages? Really, they just love to take pictures. So that was Instagram. Instagram, which obviously everyone knows now,、uh, was not the first idea. In fact, the first idea had a whole app, had a whole logo, had a whole everything, and no one has ever heard of it, because the first idea is never really the one that works in the end, and we should never fall in love with the first idea. Another example. Is a app that、um, a bunch of people created a、uh, few years ago. 
they thought, you know what, it would be a great idea if I can tell people, my colleagues, where I am that day. Am I available? Am I at work? Am I, you know, going out to, to take my kids to the school or whatever? To tell my, my colleagues of my status. And um, they thought it would be a great idea. But in the end, that wasn't what people used it for. They saw that people tended to create their own statuses and type little short messages to each other, right? They tend to message each other with this uh, functionality. So does anybody know Good evening, what Kathy. this turned into? Hello? Hello? Hey, someone said something. Uh, my question so this mm. uh, was WhatsApp. So this turned into WhatsApp. Okay. WhatsApp, the Lion, the origin, uh, this simple app to share statuses with each other. And it turned into WhatsApp. So very, very different, right? The first idea is never the one that you always end up with. The real principle is love the problem, right? So um, most uh, entrepreneurial ventures and ideas are really trying to solve a problem. So understanding what problem it is that you're trying to solve at the very outset is really fundamental. The second principle is don't fall into the build trap. What is the build trap? The build trap is when you have an idea, you wake up. So I'll tell you a story. Um, in 2009, there was a guy called uh, Paul Jacobs. Um, Paul Jacobs had a great idea. He was I think in the shower one day, and he was saying, you know what, I bet people would love to watch pay TV on the internet, right? They would love to watch pay TV and they would love to watch it on a portable device. So the next day he went into his office and he told his team to build this. And he was the CEO of a company called Qualcomm. So he had a lot of money. He had hundreds of millions of dollars at his disposal to invest. And so his team did. His team built a service of pay TV that flopped and no one used this. And he spent something like 800 million on this. He's not the CEO of Qualcomm anymore. So the trap that he fell into was he had an idea and then he went and he built a product straight away. He went from idea to product development. He fell into that trap. Instead, really, the basic concept of lean entrepreneurship is you have to test and you have to validate your assumptions. So the very first thing when you have an idea is to understand, well, actually, well, who are my customers and will they buy and use my product? How do I test this without spending a lot of money? How do I test this with, with spending zero money really is the real question. And then you go into product development. So this one is, is, is quite, quite, a human trap to fall into because when we have an idea, we tend to think, okay, I'm just going to go and build it. I have an idea for an app. I'm going to build an app. It's not natural to think I have an idea for something. Stop. I'm going to test things first. I'm going to break this first and then maybe I will build it. Okay. So this is a second principle that is very, very key. Um, so here's an example. Uh, these two guys are the founders of a business called TransferWise. Um, I guess you guys have heard of uh, TransferWise before. TransferWise? Yeah? So TransferWise is um, a fin fintech startup uh, about uh, for people to send money to other countries, right? So um, these two guys, um, Tarvet, and Christo, as they're called, in 2011, they're from uh, Estonia, and they were working in London. And they thought, hey, you know, we, we have a mortgage to pay in Estonia every single month, and we have to send money back to Estonia every single month. This is costing us so much money. The bank is taking so much commission. This cannot go on, right? There's got to be a cheaper way of doing this. So they thought, hey, wouldn't it be great if we made uh, a money transfer service that just worked like magic? and was a very low commission. They had an idea, okay? Now, they went and they were seeking investment for this idea. In 2011, nobody would invest in this. Nobody wanted to 
uh, invest in this because they didn't think it would work, right? There was no evidence, there was no proof that this idea was going to work. So it forced them to not go into the build trap. Instead, this is a true story, what they do, um, they created a very, very basic landing page. They said, you know what? If you want to transfer money, input the amount of money you'd want to transfer, where you want to transfer it to, and submit. And they said, let's just see how many people will, uh, will actually um, try and transfer money through this very basic landing page. And then what they did was they were bankers, but every single day after work, after working, what, 12 hours as a banker, they would go home and they would sit there, have dinner, and then afterwards spend about three, four hours using spreadsheets to manually transfer money from uh, accounts that they've set up. And they would do this every single day for months until eventually they processed one million pound worth of payments, charging customers from day one. So they proved without building any sort of complex uh, tool or any sort of complex um, money transfer remittance service without any of the integrations with Swift or anything like that, they proved there was a cust there was a market and they were making money from day one. So that test, this experiment allowed them to go and raise the money they needed. And then they were valued at 3.5 billion in 2019. So this is just one example of how not to fall into the build trap, right? They originally wanted, I've got an idea, let's just go and build it, but they couldn't. So they just created a very simple manual test and that's what got them to success. So provide the outcome without building the outcome really is the key principle here. The, the third one is probably one of, um, the principles that brings everything together. And it's one that is also most applicable to uh, large organizations. Commit resources as uncertainty decreases. So when you have an idea, right? So say you are this guy and you have an idea, you are in the early stages. When you have an idea and you're searching for proof, the, the uncertainty at this stage is extremely high. Okay, you don't have any evidence that this idea is going to work out. So of course, the uncertainty is extremely high. But this guy, his name is Nick. Okay, so this is another story. Nick was um, a guy who thought, you know what, back in the early 2000s, he said, I believe people would buy shoes online. Obviously, now we all buy everything online. But 20 years ago, buying things online was very, very new. So he thought, hey, you know what? I believe people will buy shoes online. And so what he did was um, he said, look, I don't have the money to create a very, very fancy website 20 years ago. But what I will do is um, I will create a very simple website and I will go to shoes shops and I will take pictures of the shoes and then I will upload the pictures onto the website, right? And I will see who wants to order this shoe. And then once I've got the orders, I will go to the shop, buy the shoes, and then ship the shoes to people. Okay, so very, very hack, very, very basic, very, very gorilla, because he didn't have the money to build a fully working e-commerce site back then. So he did this test, he had an idea. And what he did was he spent initially $300 to set up a very simple shoesite.com website, web page, where he can upload photos and have people say, I want to buy this shoe. What happened was he realized that people love doing this and he had to always go back to the shoe shop, get new shoes and ship it to people, right? So this was a big success. And um, I don't know if, if anybody recognized this guy, but um, this shoe site.com turned into a brand called zappos.com. Have you guys heard of zappos.com? Zappos.com was sold to Amazon um, for uh, quite a few billion dollars. So they're a very big um, shoe brand that started from a guy who thought, you know what? I just wanted to sell, sell shoes online. And for him, when he had the idea, the risk and the uncertainty was super high. So what he really tried to do was to decrease the risk 
systematically. The first step to decreasing the risk was, you know what, let's just put a website up with pictures and see who wants to order, okay? And once they do that, then I will spend a bit more money to upgrade the website and see if more people will order. And eventually, as people ordered, he could then take that proof and get investment of 150K to scale this up. Eventually it became Zappos.com. So the principle here is, is, is really simple. Why is there a method to help entrepreneurs and anybody looking to develop a new venture or a new idea? The method is about decreasing risk. So sometimes you speak to entrepreneurs and you say, wow, you're so, so ambitious. You're so um, amazing. You know, you're so visionary. Where did you come up with this idea, right? To reinvent something, to completely revolutionize this industry. And the truth is, the most successful entrepreneurs are the ones who de-risk really, really well. The most successful entrepreneurs are the ones who think, what's the next thing I can do to just decrease the risk a little bit? What is the most uncertain thing that I just need to prove and, and prove that it, it's true? Oh, okay, that's what I'll do. And then once I've done that, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And slowly but surely, it grows from there. And that's the that, this is often a... Uh, you know, a fallacy of, of entrepreneurship. People think you wake up in the morning and you have a vision for a future and you just go off and build it. It's not typically how it happens. Typically, as I'm sure we've all heard of this phrase, you build a minimal viable product, right? Has everyone heard of this phrase before, right? Raise, raise your hand if, if you're out there, right? Yeah, exactly. So a minimal viable product is, is itself an experiment to decrease risk. What is the minimal amount of time, of money, and of um, other people's commitment that I should put in to prove a certain level of viability? That's why it's called minimal viable. Um, so for Nick, his name was Nick Swinman. He took shoes. He took pictures of shoes in the stores. He put them onto this website online, and that was his minimal viable product. So. The story here is really systematically reduce risk with a proven process. It doesn't sound sexy, <laughs> I know, but it's exactly the type of process that works. And the fourth one is um, kind of bringing everything together, um, apply a scientific approach to entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, you, may you may realize that you know, a lot of these principles are, are pretty scientific, it's, 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 it's science. You have a hypothesis, you have an experiment, you measure, and then you see what the results are, what that means, and you do more experiments. That's all it is. You're constantly experimenting. You're constantly coming up with the next hypothesis to validate, to prove, to disprove, and then you go around again. So really entrepreneurship and innovation isn't this super, um, intangible, super sort of uh, ambiguous thing. It's actually very straightforward if you apply a systematic and an entrepreneurial uh, scientific approach to it. So assumption, I believe something is true. Test, in order to validate this hypothesis, I will make an experiment and I will be right if I see what the test says in terms of that metric. And then I have an informed decision. And that's all it is. So this is another story. Um, this guy's name is Drew. I don't know if you guys know who Drew is, um, but he was the founder of Dropbox. So um, you guys all know Dropbox, right? Yeah, I yeah. do. Right, great. So um, Dropbox, uh, and I won't play the video now because you guys all know Dropbox, but Dropbox um, was uh, created through this MVP um, scientific approach. So what do we mean by that? With Dropbox, Drew had a hypothesis. He thought, you know what? I believe people will use a file sharing system that works just like magic, okay? I put a file here, it's gonna appear somewhere else, right? And it's gonna work across this laptop, it's going to work across my phone. It's going to work across other devices. It's just going to work 
like magic. That was his assumption that people will use this and want this. So he created a landing page, a simple website to see how many people would sign up. Very, very, very basic test. Really nothing you know, super intellectual or super smart, but he just said to himself, look, if I can have at least 10,000 people sign up in the next 15 days, then it's worth doing. Then I will put more of my time into doing this. And 75,000 people signed up. So, okay, great, that, that works. So I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna go back to my investors and I'm gonna ask for more money and I'm going to keep developing this. So this is a very, very basic example of what we mean, but it's a very clear example. You have an assumption, you have a test, you measure it and you see what happens. And you get better at doing these tests. So the final you know, principle is really look for evidence by doing experiments all the time, look for proof. Um, and, and this is extremely relevant for entrepreneurship as um, I'll explain a little bit more later, but uh, decreasing risk and gathering proof and evidence are probably the most important things for innovation to work in a large organization. So another example is a startup called Dollar Shave Club. I mean, the shaving thing here is a, is, is, is an, is a bit of a clue. Um, but have you guys heard of Dollar Shave Club? The startup that was selling razors. So basically this guy, he's called Mike. Um, and in 2010, he thought, Hey, buying razors at uh, supermarkets is really expensive and it's really frustrating, right? The, the experience of doing this because I have to go to the supermarket. The razor is behind uh, the, the locked cabinet because it's, you know, it's a blade um, and I have to uh, get people to unlock and give me the razor. It's a really shitty consumer customer experience. So he said, look, there's got to be a better way. And then in 2011, he, what he basically did was he saw that his friend um, over cocktails had uh, acquired 250,000 very simple and cheap razor blades um, from, from somewhere in Asia. And he just had this, right? So he thought, you know what? I'm gonna get rid of these razors. How do I get rid of this? So he came up with an idea. He said, look, I'm gonna launch a website to test two concepts. The first one is a subscription service for one razor every month for $1. And then the next service is just a bulk delivery of razors. And they ran that idea from his apartment for eight months. So a delivery service, subscription service for razors for people. Um, and that worked out. So in the end, what happened was they started to make profits um, after a promotional video. And in the end, long story cut short, Dollar Shave Club was acquired by Unilever for, uh, I can't remember now, over a, over a billion. So another success story for, for a, uh, an idea that really came from a very early stage experiment and a test to see whether or not people would buy because there was a problem that he saw existed. Um, again, I'm not going to play the video right now, um, maybe you guys will want to watch the video. Uh, it's worth definitely worth watching it. This is probably the main video that got them to, uh, to to get those customers. But in the end, Dollar Shave Club raised 20 million in venture capital funds, and they expanded the product offering um, to, to to more things. Uh, at the end of the year, they registered 19 million in revenue, and then in the end, um, they were acquired by Unilever for for one billion. So. These are all examples of, um, of startups, of entrepreneurs with a very early stage idea for something. And they followed somewhat of a systematic process to basically validate their assumptions behind it. What is it that I'm unsure of that I don't know? And how do I test this? What is the minimal viable test that I can run? And with that proof, I can do more. Now, don't fall in love with your first idea. Mike didn't fall in love with this first idea, right? He had razors. He tested two different concepts, subscription service for one razor a month and then bulk delivery of, of razors, right? He didn't really care either one. He was testing the uh, results of two. 
Um, don't fall into the build trap. He did not go and create really luxury, uh, very, very expensive razors. He went and he used very, very simple and cheap razors to test the concept and see whether or not there was demand, right? So in this case, I've seen people who say, right, what I need to do is go to a manufacturing company to go to um, designers and create the very best product. But that would be falling into the build trap. For him, he committed resources as uncertainty decreased. So when he had the idea, uncertainty was extremely high. And then when he used the scrap raises, he realized that people were interested. He then invested more money into a video, which then increased demand and therefore he was able to raise money. And all of these small steps helped to decrease the risk and make this whole project more certain. And as he did that, he spent, as the risk decreased, he increased his amount of investment and resource from 4,500 for a video all the way through to obviously spending all the money that he had raised. So don't commit large amounts of money, time, or commitment to things when the uncertainty is high. Um, I've also had lots of conversations with um, uh, VCs who say, you know what, if, if, I have, if I come across someone with an idea, a young founder or someone who wants to start, a, you know, build a startup, um, I want to see commitment. I want to see that they're willing to quit their jobs. I want to see that they are willing to invest in themselves and, you know, that they can back themselves. That's true. That's nice. That's great. But actually, that's not smart. And, and, you know, if you are right now someone who's working uh, in a large organization and you have an idea, right, for a startup and you're thinking, what should I do? Should I quit my job and, you know, work on this or should I not? Well, the correct thing to do, in my opinion, is to try to decrease risk and you only increase your resource as you see proof. So maybe the first thing you do is think, OK, what is the minimal viable test? And maybe I only dedicate three hours of my week to doing this very initial test. And there's a very clear metric. If I hit that metric, then I'll invest five hours of my week until eventually you get to a point where you say, okay, I have to quit my job. That would be the smart way. That would be the systematic way. Um, I'm not saying that VCs and investors are wrong. I'm just saying um, that they're wrong sometimes. <laughs> um, so, he also applied a scientific principle, uh, Mike. He had an assumption that, that people would love bold and fun concept for buying razors in a cheap and convenient way. Um, he did that test with this video. Um, it's definitely worth watching. You know what, I, mean, I might just play, can I just play the video? It's a couple of minutes long, but it's probably worth watching. Can you hear the sound? Ah, okay. All right, never mind. Um, I will share the link afterwards. You, you guys should definitely watch it. It'll make you laugh. But it was a test. It was an experiment. He thought, I'm going to spend 4,500 for an experiment and I'm going to see the uptick. And he got 12,000 12, 12, orders in the next 48 hours from that. And that helped him to inform a decision to raise more funding. So that is really a very high level introduction to four key concepts. Um, like I said, um, we tend to introduce these concepts in, in stories and case studies. Um, there are many more idea, many more sort of case studies and examples of this. Um, but one thing I do want to say is uh, these are examples of startups, not within large organizations, right? So entrepreneurial principles are very, very key. But how successful these principles are within a large organization is very is, is going to depend on a lot of other factors. Um, the difference between large organizations and small organizations, that's something I do want to touch on as well. So I'm sure many of you have heard this motto. My motto is move fast and break things, right? Uh, large organizations say, you know what, I want people who want who can fail fast, make mistakes, right? Um, move fast, break things, reinvent things. This is what they say. Um, 
But you know what? If you're doing this in a large organization, you're not going to last very long. The truth is moving fast, breaking things does not go, is not compatible with the culture of a large organization. Okay, this is the truth. And um, when people say, you know, we want to create a culture of failure, culture of learning from our fail failures, oftentimes they don't really mean it directly, right? They don't really mean it like that because this is the truth. What is the difference? A large organization can't just copy and paste those lean principles that I just talked about, right? Uh, don't fall in love with your first idea. Commit resources as uncertainty decreases. Don't fall into the build trap scientific principle. You can't just copy and paste these principles and expect it to work in a large organization because organizations are different. Um, in large organizations, it's big and it's complex. You have lots of stakeholders and departments. You have direct managers, indirect managers, C-suite, suppliers, distributors, customers, users, lots of different stakeholders. And you have lots of different departments, finance, HR, IT. Um, I don't know from experience how many people here have tried to create anything, have tried, tried to create a new innovation project within their organization. Um, any stories? Anybody want to uh, kind of share an example of that? and how easy it was or how difficult it was? No? Okay, well, it's not very easy and it takes a long time because of these reasons. And large organizations are well configured, right? They have a lot of processes, they have a lot of procedures, they have a lot of protocols. If you want to do something, you have to follow this rule. If you want to do that, you have to follow that rule. Okay, and that does not help either. So if you want to run an experiment, if you have a bunch of assumptions for an idea that you want to test, it's not always easy to just go and do it, especially if you are asking for resources and help from your organization, right? Because these policies are in place. Well, you know, we always think of startups as being very small, very straightforward, just a few people, not very many dependencies. You have a tech person, you have a business person, you have a design person, and today we just get stuff done, right? It sounds amazing. It sounds like, oh, that's, that's the Nirvana, that's the Holy Grail, right? I wish that was the case in my large organization. And also startups are very flexible, right? Today, we do things like this. Tomorrow, we're gonna do things differently. There'll be a whole different process. We can just change things up every day. That doesn't happen in a large organization, but you have flexibility in a startup. Startups are good at being quick, right? That's the key. This helps them be quick, but 80% of businesses fail, right? 72% of all the new products flop. So they don't get very far. And that's the difference. You have a high volume of startups, but you have uh, a low likelihood that any single one of them will work. So really, large organizations have a lot of resources, right? They have specialists and experts, knowledge, IP, technologies. They have a global reach. They have in-house talent. There's a lot of resources available. And they have economies of scale. So existing and loyal customers, a supply chain experience, often well-known brands and access to market already. So these things are assets that large organizations should take more advantage of if only they could unlock these assets to be faster. So that's the key question that we try to answer. How do you help large organizations to be innovative and entrepreneurial? And how do you help them to apply some of those key principles um, of lean entrepreneurship? Um, the way that we, uh, that I think about this is um, there are lots and lots of innovation processes. There are lots and lots of innovation frameworks and methods out there, right? I'm sure in your companies right now, you'll have a, uh, a slide somewhere that shows a innovation pipeline, right? A funnel, a pipeline of lots of ideas, and then there's a stage gate, and then there's 
you know, um, another stage gate, there's a process for how you do experimentation. There are these uh, frameworks that innovation uh, experts use. You'll also have a portfolio, right? You'll have that diagram where people show you, um, uh, I'll show you a, a couple of other examples of this. Uh, how do I I'll stop sharing this? And I just want to share um, a couple of other slides. So, for example, this slide. You'll see that, you know, maybe your organization has a portfolio like this, right? An innovation portfolio where you say, we have um, very simple uh, current ideas and innovation propositions that we can run um, in the horizon one. Then we have ideas that are more about making new things that are um, kind of a new technology, new business model that we can operate at horizon two. And then we have things at horizon three. So things that we can do quickly, things that will take a little bit more time and things that will take maybe a long time to do. But the ones, that take a long time are the ones that will completely revolutionize and change the game. And then you have ones at the earlier stage where it's very quick, but actually doesn't make a huge difference, right? So you have different portfolios and there are all of these frameworks that innovation experts will use. But the problem really is in my honest opinion that these frameworks, every organization have, every organization really understands. But the difficulty when it comes to creating uh, new products and new services that can truly evolve an organization for the future is talent, is people. So that is the most ambiguous element. When you are trying to work on an innovation concept, um, can you guys still see my screen? Oh, there you go. Uh, one second. So when you are trying to work on an innovation project, the hardest thing is to have the right talent because inevitably, like we saw in the decreasing of the risk uh, graph, every single time you do an experiment, you will learn something new you will realize that perhaps your assumption was wrong, that perhaps customers or users don't actually have this problem or they don't behave the way you think they do, right? WhatsApp was not the first idea. Instagram was not the first idea. They had to pivot, they had to change. Now, in organizations, in large organizations, a lot of people find it tough to deal with that change. A lot of people find it tough to um, have an experiment test and realize that they're wrong and then they have to come up with a new experiment and they have to pivot this is often the hardest bit having the talent that can work in this way so for us at studio Zao, um we really focus on that we really focus on helping organizations to realize that the most important aspect that they can do to try and build the capability the skill set to innovate is to invest in their people and to try and unlock and develop these entrepreneurial skills in their staff. So that we work with these organizations to do that. Um, and the main reason behind this is for us, organizations are dealing with a world where change is happening every single day. That's the reason why organizations want to innovate. When you want to innovate, building a workforce fit for the future is probably the most important strategic priority. And, and this is the key point. If you want to innovate as an organization and create new things, you need to have talent that can do that, that can learn from new experiments. And that is often the piece that's missing because most businesses realize that, you know, their current workforce is not fit for that new world. And for us, a workforce fit for the future really consists of entrepreneurial talent, entrepreneurial leaders who have these skill sets, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, dealing with 
ambiguity, dealing with uncertainty, um, and being resilient through all of that. So 50% of executives rank creativity and entrepreneurial spirit as top workforce requirement. 75% um, rank creative problem solving, ability to deal with complexity and ambiguity um, and communication as the most missing skill sets. These skills are the ones that are most in need. And really to upskill the workforce in entrepreneurial skills is critical to survive through this new era. So really entrepreneurial skills are the, the key difference between organizations who can innovate successfully or not. Um, it's like learning an instrument. When you want to learn an instrument, you need to practice and you need to get good at playing or uh, practicing in order to be good. So you have to learn the skill and that's no different for an organization. So I'm not gonna go through all of these stats now, um, but suffice to say, what we do is we help organizations to develop and empower that internal entrepreneurial talent, the leaders of the future. We call them entrepreneurs. Um, and we help them to adopt those principles, the principles that I explained earlier um, and more. We help them to understand how to apply those principles within large organizations where, are, where there are those constraints, where there are those constraints around procedures, protocols, processes, and they need to get funding and they need to get resource commitment from senior stakeholders and bosses. That's not easy and it's very tough, but applying those principles in large organizations is the way to, to innovate. Um, Entrepreneur is, is, is actually a fairly new word in and of itself. Um, so a definition of this in, in, in our opinion is creative problem solving skills to develop um, value generating opportunities uh, to scale into the market. So that is really what an entrepreneur is in, in, in our uh, concept. And what we do is we run and uh, design in-person and remote innovation and talent programs to help these organizations um, to discover how entrepreneurship can transform the organization and to empower these people. So empower really means to upskill, to train, and also to help people apply. We work with organizations where um, they want to develop new products, new services, um, and what we do is we design the uh, sort of sprint processes and the program and the environment and the tools to help them do it, to help their own people to develop new products and services. And we also coach um, these internal teams to go through that process. So we don't do it for them because that's not learning. We help them to do it for themselves, which is often a bit harder but it is the one that is more um, future-proof. So that's kind of um, a very quick uh, overview of um, what we do and what we believe in, in terms of entrepreneurship and uh, entrepreneurial skills. Um, there's a lot more that I won't go into right now because um, it, it's, it's a lot more theory uh, that is quite late now. But what I do want to say is, um, some examples of, of the work that we've done. Uh, so with Sony Music, we helped the global executive leadership team to create an innovation strategy and learn how to lead innovation. So one thing is to say, you know, we have a group of um, mid-level or junior employees who want to create a, a, a new app or to create a new algorithm or to create a new proposition or something. It's another thing in large organizations to try and help the leadership to understand how to enable, how to support, how to fund, how to incentivize these innovation teams to, to be successful. Um, leading innovation within large organizations is the other most important point of entrepreneurship. It requires the right environment for it to flourish. Um, with a company called Pentland Brands, uh, for example, uh, they own brands like Speedo um, and LS. Uh, we help them to create a pipeline of innovation ventures um, and help them to develop uh, a portfolio of 12 new product services 
um, of which three are going forward into production. So this was purely about helping their own people to develop new ideas and new concepts. Um, with companies like uh, this one, a global manufacturing client, it was uh, a very simple workshop around lean innovation principles um, and lean entrepreneurship principles. And we've also worked in the academic uh, space with, uh, for example, the Imperial College um, and a bunch of other um, academic institutions to translate commercial, uh, to commercialize academic research and translate that research into, um, well, uh, to, to, into a commercial setting to create a revenue generating proposition out of that. In this case, it was about food um, and working with uh, food businesses, uh, but we also do that as well. So those are just, um, you know, very few examples. Um, I will stop there. Hopefully that was um, uh, informative in some way. And there were some, some principles there that you may find that's applicable to some of the things that you're doing. But I will I'll pause there if you have any questions. Wow, that's so amazing, so amazing. I feel my brain is still working. There are so many new experiences coming. Thank you very much for Jimmy's presentation. Uh, and then we're going to start into the Q&A stage. I think I need to make sure that I'm the host of the event. I want to first ask a question. Uh, uh, 喜欢大家不介意，<笑>然后我比较喜欢问别人问题，就是我会问呃、uh, ，What's a typical day for you？ 然后你每天像你可能有很你的工作量很大，你是怎么 manage 你的 stress？ 比如说你你喜欢去这个做舞台这个表演，有没有你有其他的呃，就是缓解自己压力的方法？比如说你跑步吗？有没有啊、呃、做其他的运动之类的？能不能给我们分享一下 ？OK。Um, uh, was was I work out? Okay, 我我是做一些运动。我我我做嗯， um, 一般在家里面或者在在 park 嗯、um, 里面我会做 workouts。嗯、um, ，我不是一个特别喜欢跑步的人，所以我知道这是一个 running club。嗯、um, ，所以也许我我不会和你们一起去参加跑步，可是。呃，我会做一些别的 exercise， 像嗯、um, body weight exercises， 呃、uh, high intensity、uh, workouts， 嗯、um, sort of cardio and、uh, hit exercises、mm.。Um, stress， 这是一个好很好的问题。其实今年我也觉得大家恐怕也也感觉到很多的 stress， 对吧？今 twenty twenty 是一个很特殊的一年。Let's put it that way。Um, 我每一天 manage stress. 其实，呃、uh, ，I don't really have any great solutions to that. Um, I tend to uh go out for a walk every single day, and um, I will try and do a workout every single day. Um, 我不知道现在大家有没有去办公室，可是我一我我还我现在也还是一个星期也去去办公室两天吧。所以我还是 try to get out. Um, I don't know if you guys do that. 嗯，谢谢吉米。那可能我们呃其他的朋友还有很多问题，也许有一些 technical 的，或者是一些更 general 的问题。那欢迎大家开始提问。啊、呃，大家可以自己开麦，因为我现在看不到哪些人想提问或者举手的，大家可以。可以先停止 share screen 就可以看到了。啊，对，吉米能停止。啊，好的。那大家可以提问了。没提，没提什么。啊，好，那没没什么。嗯、uh, ，OK，OK，、okay, okay. um, h e l l o j a m i e t h a n k you for your、uh, excellent presentation, which was very inspiring. So you mentioned that your company will support and empower internal entrepreneurial talents. It sounds like.、Yeah. You only focus on a few individuals in a company,、uh, rather than to encourage、uh, every staff or every colleagues to,、um, to 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 embrace about the、um, innovative changes. So, 
what's the reasons behind your business module? This is my first question. And the second question, um, regarding to a company or even a country, uh, what do you think is the strong engine to cultivate the um, innovation or entrepreneurship in a company or in a country? Yeah, thank you. Um, good questions. So the first question was, um, why do we have a model where we encourage, uh, where you said we encourage a few people to be entrepreneurial in an organization and not the mass masses, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I, I think that uh, entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship are different things. They are very similar when it comes to some of the fundamental principles like, like, like I kind of talked about today, but they're different because um, intrapreneurship is something that works in the context of uh, an existing organization's strate uh, strategic direction. So um, some clients that I've worked with definitely want everybody in their organization to be entrepreneurial, to be mm -hmm. innovative. Some clients are not in an industry or are not in a organizational structure where mm. that is the right way to go about it. Um, and so that's the first thing is it really depends on what type of context you're working within. So for a, for example, a technology business, right? Mm. For a technology business that is very product driven, innovation and entrepreneurialism can come from a lot of different places. And in fact, that's why companies like Google will encourage its employees to do, you know, the 20% time thing where they take a day a week. They don't actually do that anymore. And it didn't really actually work like that, but mm. it's more useful for a company like that because the capability to very quickly create and test new things can come from many people. Whereas an organization that perhaps is, uh, I don't know, like an organization like like uh, EY, where I used to work, that would not work. <laughs> that that the, the innovation that needs to happen in that situation should come from a few different places to mm. be strategically aligned mm. and to see the 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 return on that investment um, and become and be better managed as well. So. Um, the, the short answer is it really depends on, on the organization and the structure. Um, and there are, there are some other reasons as well. Um, but we, we generally do believe that the more people who can be entrepreneurial and innovative, they should. Um, but they do it in different ways. So it's one thing to say the people that work in, uh, in the innovation team mm. or in product should be entrepreneurial. It's another thing to say our customer service staff or our um, administrative staff can be entrepreneurial. They all can be, but being entrepreneurial as a customer service staff may be a bit different. How can you be entrepreneurial and innovative in how you solve problems that happen every single day? That's often a, a question that we have our clients asking us is, you know, it's all very well and good that you have this process to help people come up with you know, new, new things, transformational things. But how do we help people be more creative today, now? How do we help them solve problems that they're faced with now? It's, and, and, and that's a different aspect of, of being entrepreneurial and creative that, you know, sometimes organizations um, do ask for as well. Um, your second question was, uh, what was your second question? <laughs> okay. Um... Okay, the second question is, uh, the, you know, uh, I'm not very convincing, <laughs> um, but um, uh, I, I, I trust a mechanism to encourage everyone, even uh, the, the individual uh, staff could not be entrepreneurial, um, but at least a, a very small potato may contribute his or her feedback, yeah to to the products or services um anyway yeah so my second question is um what's the strong engine to to cultivate an environment of the um for the innovation 
or for the uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Mm. Um, I think that this is the piece, this is the bit where everyone has a role to play. So um, the strongest engine, in my honest opinion, is for people to really embrace um, mm. this this kind of what's my hypothesis what's my experiment what's my learning mm. um, how do I validate this hypothesis further this is a approach that I think everybody in an organization should use right mm. because this is an approach that not only works with coming up with innovation ideas but it also works with you know everyday business as usual customer ideas it also mm. um, is applicable for um, you know, lots of things on the day to day. So for me, that's the piece where when executives say, I want to foster a culture of innovation, I want to create um, entrepreneurial spirit within my organization. Um, for me, what they're really trying to say is how can I get all of my people to think and behave and work more like this um, on, in, in that way that I described? Um, mm -hmm. And for me, that's probably the most important thing. Um, but that learning, the key thing is this learning is, it has to be lived. This is the difference between uh, entrepreneurial learning and training versus maybe, you know, doing a, a finance uh, a, a kind of certification or learning uh, Prince 2 or, or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. that, those things are more, theor are more sort of, I will learn it in a classroom setting. I know the theory. And more or less, I can, you know, apply it in certain settings. It's set. Whereas the best way to learn these more entrepreneurial skills is you have to do it. There mm. is no other way to learn it other than doing it. Because it all sounds so simple when you talk about it. Because it is. None of it is complicated. The hardest bit is doing it and doing it well. So that's the, that's the tough bit, is how can you give more opportunities for people within organizations to do it for real. Mm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mm, 谢谢妹, 谢谢Jamie. Uh, 我们下面有, uh, 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 yeah. Um, okay, do you want me to ask the question in Chinese or in English? Okay, you can say it in Chinese. 然后之前的话我就是自己一直都没有从这样子一个就不知道就您的经验来看一般性像一个大公司去做这样一件事情它的团队都会怎么样去配置然后我们现在就感觉有一点一切都是我们去决定是真的很startup的一个project and we can set all the goals whatever we want to do we can do and everything anything <笑> 就是会让人有点confused。嗯，Well，你你的团队听得很听得像Paradise，你想做什么就可以做什么。对。Well，呃，所以你说你的团队大部分都是实习生。对。Okay，多多少人？嗯，就是有一点复杂。一之前我们团
。但现在的话，我们就更加 free 了，就有一些人去了其他部门，现在剩下的就只剩下四个实习生，我们自己就可以去设定我们想做的东西。然后，呃， okay. 对这个 case 算正常吗？嗯、well, um, ，<笑>呃，直接说这 case 不算，我觉得不算正常。可是我觉得在大公司里面没有什么正常不正常的，就是<咳>听起来像，嗯、呃，你的这个团队有没有一些嗯、呃、很 clear 的 KPI？ Not really。哦，没有。我们我们给 define 的是 branding。OK， 那那你的团队的 What's What's the name of it, the team？ 呃、uh, ，Australix。OK， 所以 ，But 你们的 job 是创新，就是去找新的呃，就是创新的机会，然后去 test 新的 idea， 是吗？嗯，就怎么说呢？就是我们没有一个很 clear 的 description what we need to do。嗯、um, ，然后我我主要的话就是，我就想跟呃，对新闻啊，有人知道我们，天啊，对我们公众号是那个新闻计划公众号，我看见有人在留言里面，呃，说，就是我们团队、okay. 呃是那个做新闻计划，就是福利英国针对于。英国本地化以及年轻受众群体的一个品牌宣传推广的这样一个任务。然后我问这个问题，主要的目的是想要，就是因为您经验比较多，我对这一块就这个 case 它算一个什么样的操作，这个我不是很了解。那现在我知道的是，像您说，这不就在大公司里面什么样的事情都可能发生。Um, 嗯，那就是我我不太清楚你的问题是什么。<笑><笑>对我我我本身的问题就是想要知道这个，就我现在的这样一个工作形式和模式在，在呃咱们经验中是不是比较正常的？然后我应该怎么样去？嗯、um, ，sounds sounds sounds like you there needs to be more、um, leadership in the team, maybe, uh, and and a clear progression, perhaps,、mm-hmm. um, and clearer targets for for what it is you you guys should be should be trying to do. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what else to say. Maybe I think I need to, I should ask in this way, like, what do you think the leaders? The directors will want us to do or contribute to the company in such a case. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, 这样，这是个好问题。Yeah. 如果我在你的 ，if I was in in your shoes, right? 我会这样子，我会去，嗯、um, ，I would go find a number of、um, white space opportunities. In real estate,、um, I'll probably start from looking at the impact of COVID、uh, on changes in consumer behaviors, in the future of work, future of you know a number of different、uh, arenas, future of work, future of home, future of、um, entertainment, or future of whatever.、Um, I would look for and research what some of these white space opportunities might be. Um, and then I would、uh, create a number of opportunity briefs or something like that, opportunity statements,、um, and then take those to whoever your bosses are,、um, mm-hmm. and see which ones maybe most aligned to the strategy of the organization、uh, for you to test.、Um, I, I don't really know much else about the remit of your team, so. It sounds like、uh, this is something you could do、um, and, and try to focus on as an innovation team. Yes. Okay. Thanks for this question. I I think it's kind of 
personal, so don't want to take too much time off everyone. But I have another okay. question that I think maybe other guys will be interested in as well. Uh, it's like I heard about your personal journey of your working process. So what's the reason that you choose to um, working in EY after your startup? <laughs> 呃，原因是因为我我毕业以后我去做我去创创业，嗯、呃，我父母亲跟我说，我我我我给你两年，两年你没有嗯、呃、没有成功的话，那你去找工作去。啊、uh. ， that's the reason <笑>。所以两年以后学到了很多 ，didn't become a billionaire。所以嗯、呃、，I decided to go、uh, into、uh, consulting。嗯， that's。That's the real reason. Because I didn't want to. 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 I would have been a banker. I was going to go into banking,、yeah. uh, and you know, banking is is not as ex as exciting in personally, in my opinion, for what I do.、Um, so, I think I made the right choice. Cool. Um, then I have a small question. Is I don't know if in the Chinese culture, there will be this "shout jiao" thing. 然后我们现在可能很多毕业生面临的问题是，我毕业以后会有一个很好的校招机会。校招就是那个 campus， 呃、uh, ，hiring recruitment graduate program。graduate yeah。然后通过这个机会的话，就可以更容易说去进一些像 EY 这样子的大公司。呃，是。对，然后像您这个情况的话，就是放弃了一开始的呃毕业生的这个机会，后面在就工作两年之后再从社会进去，会不会更加困难呢？嗯、um, 嗯，我没有觉得更加困难。其实当时我我创业以后，这个经验，我觉得那两年的经验比。那两年在在银行里面工作的经验更更多，呃更好，这样说吧、嗯。所以我没有觉得，嗯，呃，这个选择，呃 ，held me back in any way、嗯。呃，我觉得 it helped me。嗯，还有当时我觉得，我我记得有一个朋友跟我说，你一生会工作四十到四十五年，你拿出来一两年去干自己的事情，其实 it's not that big of a deal。所以。What I did. Cool. Then, the United States company won't recommend you to do a startup before you work in this field of expertise. Then, you can compare yourself or compare yourself to other people who are already in the company. Um, this depends on what you want to apply for. What kind of job? 对吧？所以如果你去申请咨询，其实 consulting 这方面，如果你有这种创业的经验，现在是越来越好。啊，十年前你有创业的经验，那、uh, it's okay。现在如果你有创业的经验的话，其实会会 it will be very good for you。嗯，如果你想去当一个 accountant 做 accountant， 然后你没有这个 qualification， 那当然当然不行。所以 ，you know， it depends on what you want to do。And last question. <笑>是这样的，我们的我们的时间也快要接近尾声了，后面还有五个问题，只是说我现在想就是问一下 Jimmy 或者是老大的意见，我们能不能再提问最后一个问题？然后没问题，我我我还有十十到十五分钟的时时间， oh. 所以如果你们你们不需要。离开的话，我也我也没事
，那大家愿意留下来吗？那个老大，这个可以再延长十分钟吗？问题的，我们都讲了两个小时都没问题的。<笑>哦，好的，我只是怕太晚了，大家还要休息。好的，那吉米既然呃那个还给我们十分钟，那就太好了。那一飞，能不能我们把问题再留给其他的人，然后我们还可以私下里 email 吉米？好的，好吗？我看你有很多的问题，吉米可能会帮到你，好吧？<笑>那我们还是按照顺序来吧。我看梁老师挺想问问题的，但是因为前面还有一些人，那我尽量抓紧时间。那下一个是 Jessica 老师。Hi Jamie, thank you for that eye-opening intro. On、uh, entrepreneurship,、um, I actually work for one of the largest banks, so not so exciting. And I can certainly <laughs> relate to the bits you talked about earlier on. I'm sorry, you know, well, no, no, well, no, 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 nothing personal. <laughs> But certainly, you know, I, I agree in terms of you know big firms being well configured, plenty of policies and procedures and things not moving very fast.、Um, that's for sure. So the examples you shared earlier on were about,、um, you know, creating new products, creating a new business, and making lots of money from your customers. So I wondered if you have worked on cases where you helped improve、um, a process for a non-customer-facing functions within a big organization. You know, in terms of bank, for instance, finance. Risk management, etc.、Mm -hmm. um, if so, can you share an example? And also, what would you say are the main goal,、um, or maybe the perspective for innovating a process in in such、um, a non-customer facing functions? When you say innovating a process, do you mean performance improvement, or do you mean I don't know, like um, um, uh, ch changing the process by introducing,、uh, you know, a, a productizing it, something that just removes that process entirely. What do you mean by? It's, it's probably the latter. Is how how you perform、ah, okay. the process. So, for example, how you you manage the pro um the risks within the bank, or how you perform an audit project. So, how you carry out that project, for instance. How do you make more agile? You mentioned sprints earlier as well. So, how to really incorporate those into the processes and make it more innovative? You know, rather than this is how we've always been doing it. We're going to just carry on for the next few years. So, what are what are I don't know what are really the focus and the goals? For innovating in this middle back office functions. Okay. So I'll give two examples. I hope these examples kind of answer your question.、Okay. Um, the first example is、uh, KYC AML、um, and、uh, you know onboarding new new customers and and all of that.、Um, that's a ripe area. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's as ripe anymore、uh, than you know three, four years ago, but it was definitely a, a massive use case.、Um, and whether it was working with、uh, startups or whether it was working directly with with clients,、um, this was a use case that、um, you know that was always on the table to be looked at. So improving that, the way that I've always looked at it from an innovation perspective, is not performance improvement. So that would be. The type of you know consultants that would go in to map out the process, to identify the weak points, identify how they can you know、uh, optimize that process, how they can do that business change, how they can retrain or repurpose and create the tools. That transformation journey is not something that、um, I I I focus on. Nor I don't do that. I'm not a performance improvement consultant.、Mm -hmm. um, but what what I do do when it comes to these things is. To look at、um, perhaps there is a use case to implement a new proposition. So if it was KYC AML, I've definitely worked on、uh, projects, mostly partnering with、uh, startup propositions, bringing that into the bank.、Um, how to run pilots and how to run、uh, proof of concepts to,、um, you know, automate that.、Uh, I remember the project that I did with this、uh, two years ago、um, was. Around using this、uh, blockchain、um, and distributed ledger technologies to try and create an EKYC 
um, uh, kind of onboarding process um, that yeah. would basically take out a large chunk of um, some of the manual processes, mm -hmm. in fact, very manual processes and very um, unreliable processes when it comes to data um, that many banks have and how you can basically replace that with a more automated um, and more trusted uh, proposition by using blockchain. Um, but this would re this required a lot of workshopping to understand what the precise uh, scope of this use case is, um, what sort of test data is available, where you would host this uh, proof of concept, um, how long this would run for, um, what's permissible in terms of data, what's not, a, a lot of these things. Um, and so uh, I, I guess that's one example of um, looking at process improvement from a kind of more innovation standpoint rather than a performance improvement standpoint. Um, the other example I give is something that we're working on right now. It's with a manufacturing company, um, a manufacturing company that manufactures products where they need to do testing on the physical product. And this testing process is a, is, is, is a middle office activity for them. It's a very important activity because customers um, want to know that their physical product is reliable and it works consistently. So they need to test it together with um, their customers. It's basically like sprays. So you need to test the spray um, packaging and product with the liquids inside. So it all needs to be tested. Um, and that process takes a long time. It's a very manual process right now. It takes uh, weeks and weeks to get the results. Um, and so you're not very quick. And so we're looking at helping them to replace that process with um, a uh, AI machine learning based um, engine that can basically model some of the more basic types of tests and therefore mm -hmm. improve the speed and reduce the time it takes for them to get uh, and test new products with this packaging and get it to market. So um, in this situation, again, it's more of a um, kind of what is the business case to implement this? Um, how do we get the proof points needed to prove this business case from customers, from internal stakeholders? Um, what are the level, what are the different areas that we need to prove from technical feasibility to the commercial viability of improving this, uh, the cost savings that this would drive, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through to now, how are we going to actually run a control test over the next three months? Um, comparing this versus the you know more traditional methods of doing uh, product testing, um, all of this is run. We're doing we're running that through a process of help uh, of running sprints to help them design the the, the business case, design those experiments and tests. Um, we can uh, coach them so their internal teams can 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 then operate some of those experiments and think more like a uh, a founder or an entre entrepreneur would, um, and then. Well, we have, you know, then we'll do further sprints and workshops in the new year, uh, next year to help them look at those results. So instead of that process being, hey, we're consultants and we're going to come in and, and just do this for you, it's more of a, uh, we believe that your team can do this for, your, for themselves, but we'll create kind of the structure around this program of activities so that they can, they, they can do it for you. Um, because this is less of a improving existing process and more of a creating a new, an entirely new way of doing it, a new proposition um, that could itself be monetized. So because of that, we're involved um, and we run it through a sprint and coaching kind of uh, way of doing things. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it certainly is um, quite inspirational, definitely. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, thank you. Hi 是哪一群人去 approach 你们的呢？是比如说是内部这个 middle level 和 junior level 的人先去提出了 
给他们的领导提出这样一个观点：是领导找你们，还是说，嗯，这些人他们找了领导，但是觉得胜算不算不是特别大，然后先接触你们，让你们再去和领导去，呃，谈判，就是去谈论要不要去实施这样子的项目。对我就是这个问题，谢谢。嗯，嗯，很好的问题，所以。其实 entrepreneurship, internal innovation, 我我的看法是有两两种两个 direction, top down 和 bottom up, 对吧？所以你说的是很多时候，呃，这些 internal entrepreneur 没有这种，呃，没有那个 authority, 没有资源去 influence, 对吧？ They're not senior enough. Um, completely true. 所以这方面会是 more like a bottom up, right? 可是，嗯、um, ， for innovation to work. Successfully in a large organization, this is why you can't just copy and paste those principles for a startup, right? You need for that to work in a supporting environment, in an enabling environment, in an environment that incentivizes this behavior、uh, to to keep going on, and that must come from top down, right? So、mm -hmm. that so when we work with Organizations on more bottom-up programs, we always say to them, "Look, we can do this, but if what you want is to get real results and a return on this investment, and actually create、um, a few successful propositions that will improve, that will attack, you know, revenue growth or whatever, then we must also run a a similar program with your leadership." Which is focused on、um, helping them understand how to lead innovation. So,、uh, an example is、uh, again Sony Music. 刚才我给你们这个这个 case study， 我们和 Sony Music 嗯、um, 做了 a couple of different projects. 一个就是这个 bottom up， 嗯、um, ，like a I don't know how to describe like a training program for、um, mid to senior staff to develop new Propositions, new ideas,、um, but in order for those ideas to be successful, it needs to be strategically aligned. So often, companies who have employee-based innovation programs will have lots of suggestions and ideas from employees. These ideas are everywhere, and you're really trying to get ideas and solutions to a specific. Uh, problem or a specific opportunity area, so it needs to be strategically aligned. So in this particular program, we spent a lot of time with the senior leadership to help them create a clear strategic direction for how they see the future of music, entertainment,、um, digital experiences, all of these things. So that that leads into three very clear strategic innovation briefs that then can be given to the Entrepreneurs to go and innovate on, let's say, and through doing it, we also help the leadership to understand. Not only do you need to provide that strategic direction, but you also need to provide、um, a clear incentive for why people should work on this. What is the reward at the end of this? What is the the way in which you will measure their success? How do you give them more time? How do you protect their time from? Uh, other work projects that are gonna obviously pop up, and innovation time, you need to be protecting that. How do we help them understand、um, the best way to,、uh, I don't know,、um, create the right、uh, frameworks as part of the stage gate process,、um, so that their teams can come up with consistently good and strategically aligned ideas. So, so there's a whole, there's a whole. Set of activities that have to be done together with the leadership at the same time as as the entrepreneurs themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Yi, for this question. I also like this question. Then we will take time for questions. Hillary. Hi. Thanks. Hi, Jamie. Um, hey. Um, I don't want to take too much of time because it's more of like. Uh, uh, A、uh, question to do with our business, our startup, which I think you know we might need your help and we might be able to collaborate with you given what we do. But I just want to comment that I have、um, sent you a、um, uh, LinkedIn request because I'd like to talk to you、okay. offline, not taking 
too much time because I need to kind of explain to you what we do, our firm, and how we think you might be able to help. That's it. Okay. 好，没问题。Yeah. 好，谢谢。嗯。OK。如果呃，谢谢谢谢 Henry。如果 Jimmy 不介意，大家可以加他的 LinkedIn 的话，能是一个比较好的 channel。有继续的问题。呃，那我们还有呃 ，Krista。哎，是我。<笑>哎，你好，我想，哎，你好，我想问一下，就是说我原来呢也是在一家房地产公司，但是我的部门呢是研发设计部门，我就想问一下，就是对于这种需要资金链非常顺畅运转的这种公司，在我们公司其实就是我加入的时候，它还没有是一个上市的公司，所以那时候我们作为 designer 其实是有非常多的 flexibility 的。叫嗯，很多我们可以让，呃，著名的设计师啊，或者生产厂商，或者是施工方，可以配合我们做各种各样的方案尝试。然后当时我觉得这个工作是非常有挑战的，而且也是非常有意思的。但是当公司上市了之后，因为我们要保证一个是时间上面的，还有一个就是这个。呃，就是一个工期上面的一个配合，还有一个时间，就是金钱成本上面的一个配合，所以我们在后来的这个控制下面可调的这个空间非常小，以至于后来我们集团就制定了只只能保证百分之八十是用。模块模块化的，就是延续原来的模块化的设计，然后只能有百分之十和百分之二十之间的这种创新，然后包括成本的这上面，一旦就是我们有百分之十的出入的话，就是系统就会跳闸，我们就没有办法做任何事情。我就想问一下，就是对于这种，嗯。这种实际的公司，呃，就实际经营的公司，但是它里面的这种设计产品的这个部门，在你们来看来有没有什么方法可以去解决这里面的冲突？因为我最后是觉得，那我作为设计师来讲，我在这儿我觉得不能够发挥我的特长，所以这也是我就是后来离开我们公司的一个原因。但是后来呢，我们公司采取的方式是专门成立了一个体验中心，就是专门去设计呃样板区的这些的设计，然后让它。尽量的出彩，但是这个大区就是园区里面采用的就是这个利用模块化的。然后我就想问问，如果从你的角度来讲，有没有什么更聪明的方式可以解决这个矛盾？所以，所以这个矛盾是上市了以后，因为公司上市了，有很多的 ，you know， 呃、uh, ，requirements， 对吧？嗯。所以就是 constrained 你的、嗯、你们的设计的这个成本是吗？对成本和时间上面的要求会非常压得非常紧，嗯，嗯没有任何的弹性。我、well, 其实我我也没有什么 ，I don't really have， 我没有什么特别的呃精明的 solution to this， 真的，嗯、um, ，因为我也可以理解像，像就是时间对一个。一个 service-based organization， 对吧 ？Professional service， 喂，其实你你们在卖的东西是 time， 对吧？所以 ，when you're selling time， 你的嗯、um, ，where you spend that time and the cost of that is 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 very very important。所以之前我在咨询里面也是 like this， 嗯、um, ，where you spend your time， how utilized you are on what sort of projects， 这些事情是 is 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 very very important。Um, Unfortunately, 我觉得有的时候你可以留在公司里面去找一个方式，怎么去帮他们创新，怎么去帮呃领导去去看到一个另外的机会，另外一个模式去。Um, I don't know to 呃、uh, to to test something new. 可是有的时候 you just have to leave. <laughs> 有的时候 you just can't. You know, sometimes it just takes it takes a lot of time. Um. 特别是这些大 public organizations， 呃、uh, ，that are， 嗯、um, ，you know， beholden to， 呃、uh, ，the markets， 呃、uh, ，working against every single quarter， 嗯、um, ，unfortunately， it takes， it it requires more top down decision making， 嗯、um, ，to make the change happen， and if you were to stay and try and influence that top down decision making， it would take probably a very very long time。Um, and that's the reason why many people leave and do what they want to do as a startup, and then end up, 
you know, uh, disrupting or working with or collaborating or whatever with, with a large organization. Um, I, I think also that organizations need to go on a bit of a journey to understand how, how these things work. Um, I, I believe that four or five years ago, most organizations were at the stage where when it comes to innovation, I thought this is mostly just for marketing. This is mostly just for looking good. Um, it's not really something worthwhile really investing in from a business perspective. But now I think it's gotten to a point where organizations realize this is a real capability. This is something that can make a meaningful impact on the performance of the organization and the future of it. And we need to develop a real capability. So because of organizations taking it more seriously, uh, for me, the the thing that I've seen most organizations and leaders re respond well to is not, um, you need to give me more time to work on new ideas or you need to create a, 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 an experience center or you know whatever it is that they did. It's more, you need to help uh, your employees and your teams to um, work in a way that is more fitting for the future, to develop the skills that can help your team thrive for a future that's going to be more uh, complex, going to be more ambiguous, going to be more risky. And then there's a cultural change and, and that can start to stoke uh, the organization taking um, you know, structural changes more seriously. But, but that's a long process. Um, and I, I, I don't know what your company was, but it sound it sounds like um, there wasn't really much choice for you in that situation, but probably to leave. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Jimmy. That's uh, very insightful and um, um, a very insightful uh, speech with a lot of um, really uh, interesting case studies. So my question uh, possibly will contribute to another case study. We are a education uh, technology product company. So in a way, I really like us to be more innovative because every week we would design a, a new lesson, uh, a new experiment, which can transpire into a new product. Oh, we might design a new VR and AR science education uh, applications. Uh, so we, we, we have opportunity to actually do something innovative and um, uh, all the time. And, and this needs to be proven uh, to be successful in the market. And some of them will be superstar and because we distribute um, tens of thousands of uh, science education box are in 40 different countries around the world every month. Now, um, what I, what I'd like to find out that uh, whether you have similar case studies or what advice you have for the, the, this type of education product company that uh, depends a lot on innovation and also we need to be super cool as well because that's what, what we are at the moment. And another, uh, as related to this, the second question is that um, we are a British company, but actually we are a, um, we're a Russian company with British skin because the majority of the people come from Russia and we are set up in this country. Uh, what I found is a, is a really interesting culture in, in Russian company that um, uh, very different from British uh, culture. That in, in Russian company, people prefer to plan and it, it's almost like an anti-creative. Uh, uh, for example, I want to move the production um, uh, or set of or some of the production facility to China because this doesn't respond well to my customer in China and in Far East. And then I, I speak to the, the head of manufacturer in my company who is a Russian. And what he likes to do is uh, he likes to talk offline without me to, to, to the manufacturers I introduced and to ask them a set of questions, which is really mundane, such as uh, how many people you have? And uh, can you show me the picture of your production line? And can you source mm -hmm. uh, things, uh, uh, can you source other parts for us? 
And I find this is absolutely horrific uh, because uh, the, the, the manufacturing partner I establish are, are also my B2B customers. So they are gold dust. Mm. So in a way, I, I think I need to do something. Uh, I am the BD director, but I need to do something to, to create a bit of organizational or cultural change uh, without upsetting too many people um, so that the company can be more innovative and to more creative and more result driven. So these two questions that possibly I, I, I appreciate that they are probably not easy question to answer, but um, we can make a start and we can carry on offline. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, interesting. The second question is an uh, interesting uh, situation. Um, I'll try and answer both. The first one uh, was how can an educational technology company now um, continue to be innovative? Is that effectively the, the crux of the question? Yeah, we, we question. are actually, um, we are actually, I'm, I'm very proud of my company because we are very innovative. We, in terms of education technology product, we, um, we have more sales than all our competitor in the world add up together in US and oh, wow. at the moment. So that's because we are extremely innovative. Uh, but I think what we need to stay innovative, we need to be more innovative because as we as we as we reach deeper into the project, we're gonna come we, we need to take more market share. And I think to, to stay innovative is quite important. But of course it's not easy, not so easy because okay. we have certain formula to be successful. Once a company is successful, there's a inertia in the organization to say, this is the way we do it. And uh, we're successful in this way. And I bet uh, it's going to be more and more difficult to be innovative in the future. And it's education product company. So I just want to lead, yeah. to find out whether there are the relevant case studies so I can maybe introduce you and your company as a consultant. Um, th thank you, that, that was a great offer. Um, I would say that to stake innovative and to fight the inertia, which is a natural thing that happens when an organization gets successful and gets large, you know, is the innovator's dilemma, in, is to try and, to, is to try and um, put an entrepreneurial and uh, let's say experimentative um, habit into the daily, uh, business as usual of the organization. Um, so the case study that I'm thinking of right now is probably my own company. Um, we're not super large, uh, we're a small studio, um, but we, I don't want to lose the entrepreneurial um, spirit. So there is a way where we all, every single person in the organization works on a uh, side hustle. So whether it's something that will genuinely create, uh, potentially become a new revenue generating thing or uh, a super useful um, product that helps us be more efficient, I don't know. But the purpose behind creating this kind of constant side hustle program is that we can all try and maintain uh, this kind of like sharpness um, so that we never lose this feeling of what it's like to have an idea to to test something to experiment to learn from it um, and it's something that I think many you know I've not seen that many organizations just have this as an initiative um, kind of on the side constantly because you know as as you get bigger and as you need to become more um, let's say strict about costs and efficiency, this is the first thing to go. Um, but now if, if one of the things you're thinking about is how can you help the organization to maintain and uh, continue its sense of innovative edge, um, perhaps it's about saying, look, two things. Right now, the world of education has just been turned upside down. Um, all the value drivers of education have changed. Uh, you've got, you know, universities and academic and education institutions doing everything over the internet. Um, people ain't going to pay 19 grand, 20 grand when what they're, what they're getting is a Zoom lecture. Um, instead, 
the whole way that organizations who are educational, they need to deliver value in different ways. What does the future of education look like now? Um, what is the, the future value chain of education? Um, what is the, the role that an organization like us can play in that? Who are our partners? Who are our frenemies, enemies? You know, all this sort of stuff. Um, it's a sort of a, it's it's what we call a speculative speculative design process. Um, it's kind of a forward facing uh, scenario based strategy exercise, um, and this can help maybe kickstart a number of exploration areas that your organization can feed into a kind of a side hustle program. Right? Um, there's no strings attached about people needing to come up with uh, a groundbreaking idea that needs to go into production, but it's merely there to try and keep people, give people the opportunity to be innovative and to be entrepreneurial on a continual basis. Um, and maybe you offer some of your learning resources um, or, or other resources to help them do it. Um, this is a way maybe you can think about keeping the, the innovative edge, the entrepreneurial edge. Um, but you know it sounds like even to do something like this maybe you'd have to put together a business case to to kind of convince um the the, the leadership to invest in this um and for me maybe that business case is pinned on uh strategic uh, white space opportunities um and how your your team can can help you know explore those um that second question around uh, your, 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 the, the cultural difference, um, I don't have an answer to that question. I, I genuinely think though, that um, any initiative that can help your organization cross collaborate in teams that, where people work with people they don't usually work with um, may be helpful. So um, perhaps this, entrepreneurial program uh, can one of the re one of the things that it's also about is getting cross functional um, uh, cross you know disciplinary teams and people to work together who they don't who they don't normally work together um, and so another benefit is you learn how to you know bridge some of those gaps between the different silos um, whether it's a cultural silo or whether it's a functional silo um, so, so that maybe is a, a very important intangible benefit that you can add to the business case of doing a program like that. Um, other than that, um, I don't know, maybe it sounds like you guys need to get drunk together and get to know each other better. <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. I think we, we, we should definitely, hopefully talk more offline. Thank you. <laughs> 呃，由于时间问题呢，我们呃也这今天的讲座也接近尾声了。然后我的感想呢，我相信大家有很多精密分享的内容能够带回去进行深度的思考。至少对于我个人来讲是这样的，我会思考更多精密今天讲的内容。然后呃，对于精密来讲呢，我想我相信你已经看到了咱们华人大家庭啊，还有咱们俱乐部里边其实有很多。呃，成员呢有很多正能量，然后他们呃有深度的思考，也非常的 innovative，、嗯、然后对，希望你能看到这一面，虽然你接触的华人不是很多， yes. <笑>但是我们确实存在，对吧？呃呃，那还有最后一件事情呢，就是如果吉米时间合适的话呢，呃，我们非常真诚的邀请你，呃，加入我们未来的筑梦计划的导师。对我们， okay. 我们未来还会继续开展筑梦计划。这一期的导师已经满了，但是我们希望呃能在未来和你呃有更多的合作。好，谢谢。Yeah， 没问题。呃，我很呃很很 happy to do that。嗯，谢谢今天晚上给我这机会去认识大家。嗯、um, ，我觉得你们的问题都都很深刻，都很好。然后我知道，也许我的答案没有。Exactly answer all of the questions, but um, 如果你们还有什么别的想法 feel free to message me on、uh, on LinkedIn. 好的，好的，谢谢。呃、uh, ，我还代表一个会员问一下，然后和您联系最好的方式是 LinkedIn 吗？你是不是比较，比如说比较？呃、uh, ，Yeah， 都都可以，可以 WeChat， 可以 LinkedIn， 嗯、um, oh, ，都无所谓。对对对，呃、uh, ，你你有我的 WeChat 对吧？对对对。
对，我可以呃呃会后了分享给大家，如果 Jimmy 不介意的话。好的，谢谢大家。那今天晚上我们就到这里，大家晚安。晚安。拜拜。拜拜。拜拜。谢谢。拜拜。晚安。谢谢。谢谢